Tracy, in the case of the Moss and the Flames. Stand by for action. Let's go, man. <laughs> Protector of law and order. Say, boys and girls, do you ever wonder what was on the other side of the moon? That's a funny question, but, well, if you haven't wondered, you might like to know that nobody has ever seen the other side. You see, the moon revolves around the Earth. But as it does, it always keeps the same half toward us. And this gives rise to some pretty important questions. For instance, what's the other side of the moon like? We know what one side is like. We see it through telescopes. But how about the other side? Are there mountains there and craters, or is it flat? Is there any life on the other side of the moon? The scientists are almost positive that there's no life there, but for knowledge of what it's really like, I guess they're going to have to wait until somebody sends up a rocket with a camera in it to circle the moon and photograph the other side. What a wonderful day that'll be when we get a rocket like that. Well... Until that day, the secret of the moon will be kept. We'll never know what the other side is like. A secret about something we see every night, and yet which remains a mystery. It's a mystery because we just don't know what's on the other side. And now, Dick Tracy. Yesterday, Tracy and Patton stopped at a large warehouse fire to see if they could be of any help. The building that was in the process of being destroyed was owned by a firm of hardware jobbers known as the Black Marquette Corporation. This company, a shadily run outfit dealing in goods disposed of through illegal channels, had been faced with a federal investigation. And unknown to Tracy, they had decided to have the warehouse burned down to destroy any incriminating evidence. The burning itself was carried out by a gang of professional arsonists headed by a sinister character known as the Moth. However, during the burning, somebody apparently died as a body was found in the wreckage. So now the next day, Tracy and Patton are going over the still smoking ruins with Fire Chief Kelly. Have you come across anything unusual in your investigation, Chief Kelly? No, nothing yet, Tracy. Uh, I don't see how you can hope to find anything of interest here. There's hardly anything left to investigate. Yeah, the place is a total loss, all right. There's nothing left. Not even a sign of any merchandise in the warehouse. Uh, would it have been logical for all the merchandise to have burned up, Chief? Uh, almost anything could have burned up or melted if the fire was hot enough. Then I might add that this fire was certainly hot enough. In fact, that's one of the things that worries me about the whole thing. Well, fires are usually hot, Chief. Yes, I know, but it takes time for them to make that much headway. This building, you see, was equipped with a regulation sprinkler system. It was checked recently and found to be in good order. But sprinkling systems by themselves don't always put out fires, do they, Chief? No, very seldom. But they do retard the fire and create a lot of smoke, which causes it to be discovered sooner than otherwise. And yet no one saw this fire until it was completely out of control. Huh? And that's exactly my point, Tracy. Why? And don't forget there was an aid watchman in the building. Why didn't he discover it? Oh, yes, yes, him. I meant to ask you about him. Was that poor fellow that we found in the records really the night watchman? Well, according to the coroner's report, he was. No identification was difficult, though, as was the exact cause of death, Chief. Well, he probably faded from smoke poisoning and was later pinned under from fallen timber. You know, the floors apparently fell in pretty quick. Yeah, but why didn't he have time to turn in some kind of an alarm? At least on it. <laughs> you tell me. Uh, Chief Kelly, did I understand you to say last night that there had been several similar fires the last two weeks? That's right. Two warehouses and a packing plant were completely destroyed by fires that had gotten out of control before being discovered. I see. Uh, Chief, do you mind if Patton and I poke around in the ashes here a while? No, no, not at all, Grayson. If you have any questions about anything you find, I'll try to answer them. All right, thanks, Chief. In the meantime, I think I'll wander over and see Lieutenant Giles. See if he turn up anything. Hey, Mike! <clears throat> Dick, you're up to something. Hey, Patrick, what makes you think of such a thing? I can always tell when those wheels inside your head begin to spin. All right, Pat, there it is, but it's not much more than a half-formed suspicion yet. Now, listen, in the first place, after what Chief Kelly said about his suspicions last night, I took the trouble of checking on the Black Marquette Corporation, which owned this building. Come on. It seems they were suspect suspected of dealing in under-the-counter building materials. But the important point is, they were about to be faced with a federal investigation in their business methods. And so you think they might have burned the building down to have destroyed any incriminating evidence? That's more than a possibility, Pat. Yeah, but my stars, Dick, if that night watchman died in a fire that was deliberately set, that would make it murder. That's just exactly what it would be, Pat. 
In fact, it was that angle that prompted me to look into the records of the Black Market Corporation. Yeah, but Tracy, supposing that hey, something... Tracy! Tracy, Pat! Will you come over here a minute? Oh, sure, Chief. What's up? Hey, Tracy. I think we found exactly what we're looking for. Oh, what is it, Chief? Well, you see that pipe there? I mean, the one with the plug in it? Yes. Well, the point is, there shouldn't be a plug in it. That's the pipe that fed water to the main sprinkler system. Oh, well, well. Yeah. Now, look. Someone sawed off the pipe, sawed it in half, and hammered this wooden block into it. Yeah, but wouldn't anyone figure that something as simple as this would be discovered? No. Because, actually, it shouldn't have been discovered. You see, 99 times out of 100, the heat of the fire would have burned up the wooden plug and allowed the water to run out when it was too late to do any good. Well, I'd be more than a little interested to know what the night watchman was doing while this, all this was going on. Yeah, you know, I've been thinking the very same thing, Tracy. You know, you may have more of a case on your hands than you bargained for. I'm afraid you're right there, Chief. Tell me, from your experience, would you say that this was the work of an expert? Very definitely, yes. I see. Well, Pat, it looks like you and I had better get down to headquarters and do a quick checkup on all the known arsonists in town. Uh, so long, Chief. Keep me informed on anything new you find. All right, Tracy. So long. Uh... Yeah, but Dick, I thought you suspected the owners themselves had burned the building down. Uh, Pat, you remember that Chief Kelly said that there had been several other such fires lately? Mm, seems to me I do, yes. Well, I'm beginning to wonder if there isn't somebody in this town who's in the business of burning down buildings. Oh, but Dick... How would any such person know when anyone wanted a building burned down? That's only one of about a dozen things I can't answer right now, Pat. But I certainly intend to find out. We're going down to headquarters and look into every possible... Why you use your head telling the watchman was really awfully stupid? Pat. But like I told you, Mort, it couldn't be helped. We had his routine all checked, and according to the time, he should have been on the fifth floor. But the dope must have forgot something, and he comes stumbling back into the cellar just when we were sawing the pipe. Most unfortunate. And uh, how did you dispose of him? I trust nobody was thoughtless enough to shoot him. No, we didn't want to leave no bullet holes. Bernie tapped him with his sandbag. The fire did the rest. Well, I suppose that was making the best of an unfortunate situation, but... This is the sort of mistake that could get us all into a lot of serious trouble. You know, Moth, I never can figure you. You wouldn't mind burning up a whole house full of people, but you don't like to sap a guy on the conk while you're doing it. Might I inquire how come? Of course you may inquire how come you put in, but I doubt if you'll understand it. Try me. The business of setting fires flashes a highly skilled and time-honored profession. It requires skill, imagination, artistry. And it is not to be confused with so gross a pastime as murder. Yeah, yeah. Huh? Flame, where'd you come from? What a way to greet me when I was about to compliment you on your scholarly dissertation. Cut it out. No, I really mean it. You grow positively lyrical on the subject of fire, like to the lark at break of day ascending. Hey, what's she trying to do, boss? Give you the bird? <laughs> That's wonderful, Flash. I didn't know you had it in you. What do you mean? Did I say something funny? No. Uh, look, Flame, Flash and I were having a business conversation. I know. I just happened accidentally to overhear it. It's too bad the night watchman had to be, quote, sapped on the conk, unquote. It's really too bad. Uh, what, uh, what do you mean? I begin to detect the presence in this room of an unnecessary party. A fifth wheel, as it were. Flash, would you kindly blow? Now, look here. I don't take no orders from dames. Oh. Well, in that case, we can discuss what I have to say tomorrow. Of course, it'll be much too late by then, but surely the moth won't mind. All right, Flash. I'll see you later. Sure, moth, sure. If you want it that way. If your dame comes in, I've got to start taking orders for the same You know, Flame, someday you're going to go too far. Really? And then I suppose you'll have Flash sap me on the conk. I might even do it myself. You have no idea how you terrify me. In fact, I'd go running to the police for protection if it weren't for two reasons. Which are? A, they'd probably put me in jail. B, you know, and I know, that you wouldn't dare do anything to me. (laughs) 
must be wonderful to be so sure of oneself. It is. I am continually comforted in the knowledge that I'm the only member of your organization you couldn't possibly get along without. Hmm. Cigarette? No, thanks. And what did you want to talk to me about? That's better. Blackmar is pretty upset about the death of his night watchman in the fire. How do you know? I contrived to be invited to a little shindig that I knew Mr. Blackmar was attending. I knew there would be a lot of sympathetic questions asked him regarding the fire. Oh? So? There were. But the thing which was uppermost in Blackmar's mind and to which he kept returning was the unfortunate death of his night watchman. Well, it's easy enough to see what he's thinking of, of course. And if it's ever discovered that the fire was not accidental, he could be mixed up in a murder investigation. You don't think he has any idea that the watchman's death wasn't accidental? I doubt it. He's not very smart. And I noticed that. Uh, by the way, did you hear anything about his partner, Ket? But of course. Hep and Ket is on a fishing trip somewhere in the West Indies. I guess Blackmar told the truth then. About what? That he was playing a lone hand when he hired us to burn down the warehouse. It looks that way. The flame? I think I'm going to have a little job for you tonight. In a moment, we'll return to Dick Tracy. But first... Say, Tracy fans, do you ought to hear a really pleasant show tomorrow night? Well, listen to the tales of Willie Piper. It moves along so smoothly and delightfully that you'll be surprised to find yourself completely absorbed in the story, not aware that your face is covered with a broad smile. Thirty minutes pass just like that. You're left with a mellow, contented feeling. The hero of the show is Willie Piper, a well-intentioned youth who blunders his way through the darndest predicaments. He's married to a wonderful girl, and together they live in one half of a two-family house in a New England town. They live there with Willie's father-in-law whose attitude is, quote, Oh, you youngsters, just go ahead and do what you want. Pretend I'm not here. End quote. But he is there, and there's no mistaking it. And if ever you need a good example of three making a crowd, just think of Willie's father-in-law. Treat yourself to some wholesome chuckles. Listen to the whimsical Willie Piper show, and it's heard tomorrow night on most of these ABC stations. Don't miss those other great shows. ABC has lined up for your entertainment Every Wednesday night, the Paul Whiteman Show, The Pot of Gold, Bing Crosby, and The Henry Morgan Show. Now, back to Dick Tracy. Well, that completes the list of the known arsonists in town, and a sorry looking through the air, too. Patrick, I think we're on the wrong track. What we should be doing is investigating the owners of the Black Marquette Corporation and finding out if they have any known underworld connections. And indeed, there are underworld connections. But will it be possible to uncover them? Tune in tomorrow, same time, same station, for the adventures of Dick Tracy, produced by Charles Powers. This is George Gunn speaking. Well, we've been doing a lot of gabbing recently about a Wednesday night show on ABC, a show you've probably heard many times, The Bing Crosby Show. But I wonder if you and your folks stay tuned to ABC on Wednesday nights for something new in the radio world. Henry Morgan and his zany, funny program. Not exactly trying to compare Crosby and Morgan. Guess you couldn't do that very well because their respective personalities and abilities are quite different, almost as different as their respective shows. But both guys and both shows are tops. Find out for yourself tomorrow night. Crosby and Morgan, Bing and Henry on most of these ABC stations. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. And now, Dick Tracy! This is Dick Tracy, and the case of the moth and the flame. Stand by for action. Let's go, man! Yes, it's Dick Tracy, protector of law and order. Say, boys and girls, do you know how the first real man-of-war came into being? Well, just before the year 1500, warships were used to carry troops. 
who would then fire their muskets at the enemy ships and try to close in and board them and capture their crews. Well, along about 1525, the English king, Henry VIII, had an idea. He called in his ship designers and he said, I want you to take 20 cannon and build me a ship around them. Well, the designers were shocked. They had never built a ship strong enough to hold cannon, which wouldn't go to pieces at the vibration of the first broadside. They tried to explain. The king just wouldn't listen. Finally, almost afraid for their lives, they went back to their drawing boards, and wonders of wonders, three months later, had drawn up plans for the first battleship. By making the hull of the ship broader, and by using stouter timbers to brace it up, by building taller masts and fuller sails, they had actually built a ship around 20 cannon, thus promising England supremacy on the seas, building the first real man-of-war, all because they couldn't say no to a king. And now, Dick Tracy. Tracy and Patton are investigating a warehouse fire, a fire which gives every evidence of having been deliberately set. The building was owned by two partners, Blackmar and Kett, who had been doing a thriving business in the black market. When federal investigators began to investigate their illegal sales, Blackmar, one of the partners, hired a gang of arsonists to destroy the building and the evidence. This gang is headed by a sinister character named the Moth. As today's story opens, we find Tracy and Patton at headquarters completing their investigation of the Black Marquette Corporation. Tracy's at the phone. As I say, a Miss Spindle, huh? She says she worked for them about a year. Mm-hmm. Oh, thanks a lot. I'm sure this is going to be very helpful. Who is that, Dick? Uh, Jorgens, the Internal Revenue Department, Pat. They're as much interested in this fire as we are. Yeah, those fellows, Black, Marr, and Cat, seem to be interesting an awful lot of law enforcement agencies. What's the picture on this one? Well, it seems the federal government was preparing a tax evasion charge against the Black Marquette Corporation, and this fire has given them quite a setback. How come? Well, it would permit the company to claim that all of its records were destroyed in the fire, Pat. Blackmar and Kett could write off a large amount of their tax by claiming loss of personal property that was supposed to be in the building. In other words, one branch of the government is interested because the fire destroyed evidence of illegal dealings in hardware. Uh Another branch is interested because the company may avoid paying a large income tax. The insurance underwriters are interested because the building was heavily insured. And and... we're interested because a man died in this fire. Well, you've got to give those fellows credit. They don't operate in a small way. They certainly don't, although I don't think it's credit that they should get. Well, maybe we ought to get together with these other fellows who want to know more about the Black Marquette Corporation and pool our information. Which is exactly what I've been doing, Patrick, remember? Uh, you mean all that stuff you were saying over the phone about a Miss Pringle or Spindle or something? Spindle, my boy, Spindle. Well, who is she, anyway? She used to be Black Mar's private secretary. She's already given valuable information to the Internal Revenue Department. Well, if she used to work for Black Mar, why is she so keen on testifying against him? Well, according to what Jorgens told me over the phone, she disapproved of Black Mar's business methods and resigned a short while ago. Well, Maybe she just got fired and is trying to get him in trouble by making up a lot of fancy stories. Well, that's always a good possibility, Pat. But I don't think there's any harm in my having a talk with her anyway. I can go to it right now. Well, 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 if it isn't my old friend, Cupy. What are you doing out of jail, Gibby? Same thing you are, making an honest buck here and there. Making a buck, I have no doubt. The honest part, I'll have to see. You know, that's the trouble with you cops. You never believe that a guy can go straight. That's where you're wrong, Cupy. I don't give up on a man easily, but in some cases, my faith has become a little shaken, particularly after ten or twelve convictions. But I've never been convicted for nothing serious. Just boyish pranks. <laughs> particularly those black market coupons you were counterfeiting. That was quite a prank, Cupy. I was framed. Anyway, that's all over. Straight and steady. That's me from now on. Well, I hope so. You my regards to boys at the station. I won't be seeing them again. Uh, maybe. Maybe not, Kilby. Well, let's see. Apartment 1G was 1G now. Oh, here it is. Yes? I'm Inspector Tracy from headquarters, madam. May I come in? I suppose so. Oh, thank you. 
What did you want to see me about? Well, I'm checking up on the recent fire that destroyed the warehouse of the Black Marquette Corporation. I don't know anything about it. Yes, I'm sure of that, but I understand that you might be able to give us some facts that would help us get to the bottom of this case. I don't know anything. You gave very valuable information to the men from the Internal Revenue Department. I didn't. That is, it was all wrong. Now, look here, Miss Spindle. Has anyone threatened you? Of course not. You didn't by any chance just receive a visit from a man named Cupid, did you? Cupid? I never heard of a man named Cupid. Miss Bendel, I wonder if you realize that this case involves more than the burning of a building. It involves the death of a man. It involves murder. Murder? Yes. By concealing important evidence, you're making yourself an accomplice to that crime. It won't do any good. I still can't say anything. You realize, of course, that you're playing right into these criminals' hands by refusing to talk, don't you? Get out. I don't know anything. Get out. I don't know anything. Go on, Cupid. Tell me more. That's about all there is, Moss. And you're sure it was Dick Tracy you saw going into Miss Spindle's apartment house? Of course I'm sure. He even spoke to me. Well, then he saw you. Mm. Do you think he knew that you had been to see Miss Spindle? Uh, this I doubt. There's maybe 20, 30 apartments in the building. Mm-hmm. And do you think Miss Spindle conveyed any nuggets of information to our fair-haired detective? If you mean did she sing, no. I doubt it. Mm. I got that dame so scared she wouldn't say hello to her own mother. I'm curious to know what persuasive you used that so terrified the lady in question. You know, it's amazing how scared most people are of fire. <laughs> That's what I thought. However, I don't like Tracy nosing around this case. I don't like his having seen you there. He's not the stupidest detective in the world, you know. Relax, Mort. I ever had no arson rap charged to me yet. There'd be nothing to make Tracy suspicious. But it means that they're beginning to put pressure on Blackmar. It also means that they think the fire may not have been accidental. Mm. I'm um, still somewhat worried about that spindle woman. She has seen you in Blackmar's office many times when you were selling him ration stamps. If she should decide to talk, your value to the organization would be over. Maybe we should ought to take care of her now. Huh? Not just yet. Once you start killing, it's like a chain reaction, almost impossible to stop. I um, don't like anything I can't control. You can't control fires, and yet they don't seem to bother you, none. Well, that, excuse me, is different. <laughs> you know Blackmar pretty well. Can he stand the heat of an investigation? Hard to say. Kind of a nervous little guy, though. Uh, it probably wouldn't be a bad idea if I had Flame keep a close watch on him so we can be prepared if he shows signs of cracking. Just what I was going to suggest. He's dropping again, Flame. Maybe I should record all my conversations to save you the trouble of listening. Oh, no. That would take all the fun out of it. Uh, she's your girl, Chief, and you know what's best. But if she was mine, I'd give her the hot foot of all time. Well, I'm not your girl, and I'm not the Moss girl. And don't ever forget it. I have no intention of being anyone's girl. You may not live long enough to be anyone's girl, either. I wonder why everyone loves me so. All right, all right, break it up. Ah, society dames hanging around the rackets to pick up a cheap thrill. Why don't she latch onto some striped-shirted square with a Windsor tie like she ought to? What's she got to bother us for? Would you care to tell him more? Look, QP, you know that through Flame Society Connections, she steered us to some of our most profitable clients. How else would we have known, for instance, that Black Ma was in trouble and was ripe for our professional service? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who was it made the big pitch? Eh? Who was it who actually steered Black Ma in the sea? Oh, QP, I'm not trying to take any credit away from you. Your contacting of clients who are ready to talk business with us is a great value to the organization. You merely serve on a different echelon, shall we say. Different echelon. All right, say it. It'll make you feel good. But remember that you're both of any use to me just as long as no one suspects your connection with the outfit. Now, QP, I'd suggest that you run along and try to find out if Dick Tracy got any information out of that Miss Spindle, particularly any information about you. If he did, I think you know how 
to proceed? All right, Chief. Although I think we ought to proceed that way anyway. Stupid. Okay, boss. Whatever you say. May I suggest that he needs to be taken down a few pegs? Uh, he's a petty racketeer who's getting his first taste of the big organization. However, you'll bear watching. I've known a few men who offered a lady a cigarette first. I'm sorry. I keep forgetting that you're old enough to smoke. Yeah. Thanks. No, don't waste a match. I'll light it from yours. Now, what's all this about Blackmar? The local police seem to think the fire may not have been accidental. They've put Dick Tracy on the case. Is that bad? Not good, but the point is they're putting the heat on Blackmar and I want to be sure he can take it. Do you think you can find out what his plans are? I also am rather persuasive along my line. Yes, so I've noticed. What do you plan on doing? This. Hello, Tookie. This is Flame. Is that wake you're throwing still planned for tomorrow night? Good. I wonder if you'd do me a favor. Would you invite that fascinating Joe Blackmar? He's cute. In a moment, we'll return to Dick Tracy. But first... In the words of Webster, gala means a festivity, a gay holiday. And what could better describe the Bing Crosby show? It's a festivity of song and music that provides one of the gayest half-hour holidays you can find on the air Wednesday nights. As your host, there's Mr. Bing himself, singing popular melodies in his own inimitable style or blending his voice with the famous charioteers. And then there's that amazing pianist, Skitch Henderson, tinkling the ivories to top tunes of today. John Scott Trotter and his orchestra playing music that will make you want to get up and dance. Each Wednesday p.m., Bing also has celebrated guest stars on hand to join in the fun. Popular people from stage, screen, and radio that you all know and like. So, Tracy fans, for really top entertainment, be sure to listen tonight to the Gala Bing Crosby Show. And here are three other listenable shows that you'll want to enjoy tonight. There's the Mary Willie Piper Show, the Pot of Gold, and Henry Morgan Shows which we'll also bring you tonight over most of these same ABC stations. Now, back to Dick Tracy. Well, Dick, did you find out anything from Miss Fender? I think maybe I did. Patrick, I want you to find out all you can about a certain petty racketeer, a man named Cupy. Will Dick Tracy uncover Cupy's connection with the case? Tune in tomorrow, same time, same station, for The Adventures of Dick Tracy, written for radio by John Ray. This is George Gunn speaking. Well, Tracy fans, if you want to hear some really good arguments where the debaters know what they're talking about, listen to America's Town Meeting of the Air tomorrow night. Famed experts speak on both sides of important national and international issues. Naturally, a person talking for one side forgets to mention a few facts that might weaken his argument. But on America's town meeting, there are experts on the other side, too, who make sure that you hear those facts. So, Tracy fans, if you'd like to try to understand today's problems, tune in to America's Town Meeting of the Air tomorrow night on most of these ABC stations. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company.